Hello and welcome to this webinar, which is the third in the series of Beat the Parasite webinars. Um, here we are at Wood Park Farm, which is one of two working farms at Liverpool Veterinary School. Uh, I'm Hannah Park and I'm the Senior Livestock Specialist at the Farmer's Guardian magazine. I'm joined by Professor Diana Williams from the University of Liverpool and Shona Timothy from Beringer Ingelheim Animal Health. So today we will be discussing the impact of liver fluke in both cattle and sheep looking at how the disease can impact productivity on farm as well as its financial impact. Some of the areas we'll be covering uh, will include how to spot the infection from clinical signs to subclinical signs um, using things like abattoir feedback um, and we'll also be delving into the fluke parasite itself. Uh, Diana's got some examples a little bit later on to share with us. So just to let everybody know that um, your questions are welcome throughout the webinar. Um, if you look to the right hand side of your screen, you'll see a box there which you can type your questions in throughout. Please do get involved um, and we can answer any questions that you have got. Um, there'll also be a series of polls running throughout the webinar, so be sure to get involved with those as well as we go through. So why should farmers be concerned about liver fluke? Um, I'm thinking financial cost um, and potential impact on productivity losses uh, in particular. Okay, um, I think the first thing to say is liver fluke is a very common parasite. Um, we've done some studies which have shown that probably about 75%, so three quarters of dairy herds uh, show evidence of liver fluke infection. Um, abattoir data suggests that 28 to 30% of cattle livers are condemned at slaughter due to liver fluke. About five to eight percent of sheep livers are condemned at slaughter. So, so it's common um, and it's probably becoming commoner um, because of things like climate change. In terms of the economic impact, it's actually quite hard to get a finite figure to say this is how much it costs. Um, but we know in dairy herds, uh, particularly high yielding dairy herds, uh, infection probably um, results in a, um, a decrease in milk yield of around about 15%. Uh, so in economic costs, that's probably, it depends obviously on, on milk prices, but, but somewhere in the region of say about 50,000 £50, pounds a year for 150 cow um, dairy units, so, so fairly significant. In, in um, sheep it's harder to um, come up with defined costs, um, but we, we did some work with one farmer where we were uh, helping him diagnose fluke um, on his farm. Um, we were doing sequential tests through the autumn um, to determine when infection occurred so that when he needed to go in and treat his sheep. So he reckoned that he saved somewhere in the region of about £26,000 that year because we tested some of his sheep, we showed that they weren't infected. So instead of taking his men away from the harvest, he could carry on with the harvest, he got the harvest in, and then later in the season we showed evidence of infection so he was then able to go and treat the sheep. So he saved a lot of money by not having to treat and he was able to do other things. His, 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 yeah, his worker, workers were able to do other things on that farm. So potentially it can save an awful lot of money controlling liver fluke effectively. Mm -hmm. And um, is it right that all livestock can be affected, all ages of livestock can be affected by liver fluke, unlike other parasites um, where immunity can develop? Yeah, very much so. So, so traditionally, young, younger animals, first season grazing animals, would be more susceptible to things like gastrointestinal nematode infections, roundworm infections. Um, liver fluke is very different. Um, animals 
don't seem to develop resistance or immunity to liver fluke, so they can be repeatedly infected. So young stock are susceptible to infection, but older animals are susceptible as well. So adult, adult cattle, both beef cattle and dairy cattle, and also adult sheep uh, are equally susceptible to, um, to the disease, as well as obviously young stock. Um, and in terms of evidence of infection that a farmer might notice, what sort of clinical signs should, should farmers be looking out for? So there's a difference between sheep and cattle, cattle I would say, when you're looking for clinical signs. So sheep are highly susceptible to, um, to liver fluke and um, we see acute disease in sheep. Um, so that typically occurs in the autumn. It's usually very quick, as the name suggests, acute liver fluke disease. Uh, and li literally the first sign a farmer may have of infection within his animals is finding dead animals in the field. It's that quick. Um, so things to look out for um, are any evidence of, you know, the animals look sick, they, um, they have abdominal pain, they often look poor. Those are sort of typical signs that you might see of acute disease in sheep. Chronic disease, so you can see chronic disease in both sheep and cattle, um, and that tends to occur in the winter, um, the winter and early spring. Uh, and typical signs there would be, again, animals look poor, often um, they're not gaining weight or they're losing weight. Um, typically, we would see anemia in, in, in sheep and cattle. So you can just look at the conjunctiva of the, of the eye and see if they're very pale, that would be an indication of anemia. Um, I think I think those, those so those are sort of typical clinical signs that you would get with um, with with heavy infections. I think possibly what occurs more frequently is subclinical infections, and there it's quite difficult to actually pinpoint infection. Um, but we know that subclinical infections can cause significant production losses. So animals fail to gain weight um, or they lose weight um, or we see milk uh, yields um, decreasing in dairy cattle, for example. Um, so, so, so they just they, they don't look, look as good um, perhaps as you would like. Um, and often it's because they've got low-grade fluke infections. Mm -hmm. and, and specifically that subclinical or low-grade infection, is that something that could be picked up at abattoir feedback? Absolutely. Um, so abattoir, abattoir feedback is very useful because it tends to tell you um, that you do have fluke on your farm. I mean, it depends on the group of animal animals, you know, whether they're bred on the farm or whether they're bought in. Um, so there's lots of other, other things to take into consideration. But it's a very good indicator that maybe there's a problem that you want to then in get, investigate further. The other thing you can do with dairy cows, of course, is also use um, milk, um, bulk tank or individual milk samples to diagnose infection in, in dairy cows. And in terms of infection geographically, um, are there certain areas of the country that are more heavily affected? How, how is it sort of spread? Um, so, so, so fluke is, has always been sort of considered to be a parasite of um, the wetter west, if you like. So southwest England, Wales, northwest England, up into southwest Scotland. Uh, and obviously Northern Ireland, again, fluke, fluke capital of, 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 of the UK, I guess. Um, Having said that, uh, certainly we've done studies where we do tend to find fluke all around the country. Uh, we've seen fluke sort of moving into areas say on, in East Anglia, for example, where traditionally we would not expect fluke, uh, but we're starting to see fluke in those areas. And again, there's lots of different reasons for that. M movements of animals, which take the parasite to different areas, changing climate, which um, creates uh, the right sort of conditions for the life cycle of the fluke and um, changes in things like agro-environmental schemes, um, which where, 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 where farm, I, I always used to say that farmers used to be paid to drain land, now they're paid not to drain land. So, so having sort of wetter conservation areas potentially can create um, the right conditions for the, for the fluke parasite to develop. Mm -hmm. And to, to minimise that risk, there are things that farmers can do, such as sort of fencing those areas off. Is that something that you would advise? Or yeah, well, it, yes, where it's possible. Yeah. Um, certainly, many of the farms that we've worked with, um, looking at you know fluke habitat, um, 
especially in the west of the country, the areas where uh, the hab- there is habitat for the intermediate host, this, this mud snail which carries the parasite, to be honest, they're all over the farm. Mm. So it becomes very difficult to start mm. trying to fence areas off. If, if a farm just has a fairly defined fluky area, then yes, fencing really helps. And again, we've been doing some work up in Cumbria, which has shown um, that in fenced areas, you find fewer infected snails compared to non-fenced areas. So, so actually fencing can help where mm. that's feasible. Mm-hmm. So as well as fencing, um, are there any other measures that farmers could take to reduce the risk of infection on farm? Um, Yeah, there are several different things uh, that people can consider. Um, So we did some work um, a couple of years ago where we looked at risk factors for on-farm infection. Um, And one of the things which came out of that study was, was, first of all, farms that had both sheep and cattle were more likely to have fluke. And that's because um, it's the same parasite in both sheep and cattle. So if it's important when you're thinking about flute control to think about controlling the parasite in sheep and cattle. Uh, And then the other factor which came up in that risk analysis was buying in cattle. So farms which bought in cattle were more likely to have fluke than than farms that didn't had closed herds. So again, Quarantine testing and and quarantine treating is really important if you are buying in cattle to prevent buying in the problem. And that's particularly relevant when we start to think about resistance to some of the um, veterinary medicines used to control liver flukes. So so quarantine testing becomes a really important issue. Mm -hmm. And in terms of grazing, is there any management um, practices that could be adopted there? Yes, there are, although it's, 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 diffi- it's difficult to, um, to give a simple answer mm. and it very much depends on the particular farm in question. Um, so things like herd health plans become particularly important. Uh, I think the important thing to remember is liver fluke is a seasonal parasite. Most infection occurs in the autumn um, and so avoiding areas of the farm pasture which um, has habitat suitable for the snail intermediate host um, would be would be advisable Mm -hmm. that time of year if that's possible and that very much depends on the farm. Mm Just a reminder to uh, our audience tonight that both of our panellists are um, online and able to answer questions. So um, just take a look at the right hand side of your screen and you should be able to ask any questions that you have in there. Um, there's also a series of polls um, going ahead throughout the evening. So make sure that you um, take part in those as well. So just discussing snails, which we've mentioned a few times, um, I think you've got some examples to show us. Um, so um, if you could just tell us a little bit more about how animals become infected and what the life cycle is of the parasite. So just delving into the fluke parasite itself, uh, I know you've got some examples here to show us, Diana. So can you just tell us a little bit about how animals become infected um, and what the life cycle, life cycle is and the factors that are involved in that? Yep, certainly. Um, okay, so these here <coughs> are the, um, the adult parasite. Uh, these are actually stored in, in ethanol, so they do shrink slightly. So the actual real live parasite is even bigger than these. Um, and again, if I put my fingernails there, you can just see the, the size of them relative to my fingernail. So these, these adult parasites live in the liver, in the bile ducts, and they produce eggs which are shed down into the gut um, of the animal and then the eggs leave the animal in the dung. The eggs develop on the pasture and they go on to infect uh, these mud snails here. So you can see these mud snails on this pan of mud. Um, So there's a big adult snail here. Um, That's actually a very large snail. Most of them are much smaller. You can see this one here, which is much smaller. Again, if I put my fingernail there, you can just see how big they are. Um, And there's there's a tiny baby one just down here, which you can just about see. So you can see that they're actually quite hard to spot uh, in real life. They're also um, a mud colour. So against um, uh, uh, the surface of the mud, you can see that they are actually quite hard to see. So the parasite develops in the snails over the summer months. 
Um, they require um, warm temperatures and um, moisture, so they like lots of um, rainfall. Um, and the rain make, gives, makes the mud moist, uh, also uh, provides the right conditions for the algae to grow and the snails feed on the algae and the parasite develops uh, in, the, uh, in the snail. So most of the parasite development occurs over the summer months and then at the end of the summer the parasite emerges from the snail and goes on to insist on, uh, on, on vegetation, so grass and any other vegetation that happens to be growing around um, their muddy environment. So you can see here um, there are the cysts of the parasite on this piece of cellophane. So you can see they're about the size of a pinhead. Uh, so again, virtually impossible to see in real life. Um, uh, if you look, go out looking for them on the pasture, it's very, very difficult to see those. So cattle and sheep, and indeed any most other um, species, such as I mean, even humans, uh, can be infected by eating these cysts on the grass, the herbage, and they become infected. So once those cysts are eaten, they're swallowed, taken down into the gut, um, they hatch and pass from the gut and into the liver. Um, and then the parasite uh, migrates through the liver, um, it, it grows uh, as it feeds off the liver tissue and it's that damage to the liver tissue which really starts the whole disease process uh, leading to liver fluke disease or fasciolosis. That's great, thank you very much for that. Really interesting to see those up close. Um, so there's quite a bit of discussion about the disease patterns changing as a result of climate change. Do you think that that's something that, that you're seeing? Uh, yes, I think we do. We are seeing um, a changing uh, epidemiology, a changing disease pattern. Um, so liver fluke is a parasite that is very reliant on the external environment. Uh, both the free living stages of the parasite and indeed the snail intermediate host are all dependent on, um, on rainfall uh, and also mild temperatures. So what we're seeing at the moment is a much less predictable um, climate. Um, so our winters are milder. We're having, um, if, you, if you compare it to last year, which is one of the wettest years on record, compared to this year where we had a very dry uh, April and then a very wet May and then a very dry June, um, it, it just means that our ability to predict exactly when the infective stages of the parasite appear on the pasture is it's becoming much less easy to say when infection is occurring. Um, and I think, I think the fact that we've got milder winters means that the parasite and the snail can survive over the winter much better. Um, so more, there's, there's, there's higher numbers of snails, uh, there's more fluke around. I think the other thing to say is that we know that it's not just the weather over the summer of the year in question which is important but we're also finding that what has happened over the previous five years also makes a difference so for example 2018 was a very dry year and that has had a knock-on effect so we saw relatively little um, disease fluke disease in the autumn of 2018 it pushed it right back into sort of the big the early 2019 and we're still sort of seeing that slightly different pattern um, last year, for last autumn, for example. We didn't see as much fluke as perhaps we'd expect, given how wet it was. But who knows what's going to happen this year, mm. given our very strange summer and spring and summer. Yeah, yeah the weather's certainly changing every, every year, ever Absolutely. more extreme. Yeah. And what, what do you think this might mean for the sort of control of river fluke going yeah. forward? Is it becoming more challenging? Definitely. And I think traditionally farmers used to treat in the autumn to prevent acute fluke. They used to treat at housing um, just routinely in order to prevent uh, production losses over the, over the winter in house stock. And I think we, we can't recommend that anymore. Um, I think what we're, that very much the way we're thinking about controlling fluke now is diagnosis. Um, so I think diagnosis is really important before you start trying to treat cattle or sheep. Um, and we can perhaps talk a bit about diagnostic tests in due course. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we just bring in Sharnad now and um, have a bit more of a discussion. Um, 
it's interesting that um, you were mentioning that farmers are sort of sticking to that routine that they've always adopted down and sort of that that tree thing in the autumn um is that a practice that, that should be changing now should we be thinking about sort of different ways to to treat liver fluke yes uh, i think i think everything that we're seeing um with regards to liver fluke uh with changing weather patterns changing epidemiology the um infection is becoming much less predictable exactly when it's occurring and um how much is occurring each year so so i think I think we would definitely advocate um, diagnostic testing before treatment um, and if we're thinking of treating cattle at housing um, I mean one of the things that we would we would advise is using a sentinel group particularly first season grazing mm. calves for example um, so testing those before housing uh, will give a good in indication as to whether they have been exposed mm. to the infection or not. Do you advocate sequential testing through the season, Diana, to target that kind of the point at which exposure occurs? Yeah, I, again, you've got to balance cost and practicalities uh, and it depends, you know, if animals are being housed, then obviously um, a, taking a, a, a blood sample at housing is would be ideal uh, and sending those off for um, analysis. So that would be um, a lab test to detect antibody to show exposure. Um, if it, it, in sheep, um, it, it, doing that sequential testing, if they're out in the autumn, again for season grazing animals, so lambs, ewe lambs, um, they're ideal as sentinels to, to monitor and, and we advocate testing say 10 lambs each month uh, and that gives quite a good in, indication of, as to when infection is occurring. Yeah and I think it, it provides the farmer with a real insight into the dynamics of fluke infection on their, their absolutely farm as well. yeah yeah mm. i think yeah i think the whole um balance of sort of when that infection occurs and you know traditionally we assume it occurs in october november time but actually it can occur as early as august in some parts of the country and in other parts of the country we may not see infection until december january so it's very variable mm. yeah yeah so thinking about cattle specifically um why is fluke control so important for cattle at housing um, so again, I think it depends on when cattle are being housed. So traditionally they would have been housed in sort of October, but I think many farms now are keeping the cattle out longer uh, to make the most of the grass. Mm. Um, that's very much weather dependent, but um, so, so that again means that it's, we, you're not a hundred percent sure exactly when that infection is occurring. Um, so diagnostic testing is important. Um, but then if you are housing, then think about where the cattle have been grazing over the summer, particularly in the late summer uh, and autumn before they're housed, can give you an indication of the likely risk. Um, you can use some of the disease forecasting tools, mm. of which there are several, which can help give an indication of whether they're likely to have been exposed or not. Um, and then also think about the type of enterprise you know is it dairy cows dairy heifers um beef cattle whether it's suckler herd and so on mm. um i think all of those things you'd want to take into consideration yeah and I, I think that's one of the messages really is that kind of farm level risk based health planning is really key to controlling fluke effectively um one thing we've tried to promote awareness of is the importance of identifying those animals and determining if they are infected so that you can treat at housing if they are infected because I think some of the, the historical advice on holding off treatment depending on the active you're, you're going to use is perhaps not so relevant nowadays when we have access to better diagnostic testing because in reality we've talked about the, the productivity impact of fluke. If you're bringing animals into a shed that might be carrying a fluke burden or you know are carrying a fluke burden because you've tested appropriately, there's, it's illogical to hold off every day. Those animals will be, will be losing mm -hmm. um, growth or, or productivity. Yeah. I'd, I'd agree with that, that, um, you know, obviously if you're housing animals, um, you want to make sure that you target fluke in those animals mm. as soon as possible uh, and treat with a, an active which kills juvenile parasites. 
as well as adults rather than waiting sort of traditionally you would wait sort of eight to twelve to eight to ten weeks um, and treat with a, an active which targets the adult parasite but then they're sitting as you said they're sitting in the barn for all that time mm. you know, potentially losing weight or at least failing to gain weight mm. um, so targeting treatment when those animals are infected seems to be the best advice at yeah. the moment. And I think it's where, I don't know whether you'd agree, Dana, is where faecal egg counting can come in useful mm. as well, because the, the flip side of that is if you do a faecal egg count and you know they've got the adult stage, then you can be even more targeted and use an active that is going to target those later stages. Um, when we're looking at housing treatment, I think we need to think about the, the purpose of the treatment from a productivity perspective during the housing period. But also as well, remember that any animal that's going back out to grass mm. needs to stay clear of fluke so we do get that collateral benefit of breaking the life cycle mm -hmm. and that's where again I think diagnostics probably come into play later in the season with those in the housing period with those as well because whatever active you use it's no guarantee that you'll turn them out free of fluke so mm -hmm. just rechecking animals that are going to go out and determining whether they need a, a second treatment is again part of kind of a targeted approach to to holistic liver fluke control and breaking that life cycle. Mm. So resistance is something that we've heard quite a lot about as well. Um, it's sort of always on the peripheral. Is this something that farmers should be thinking about or be concerned about? Um, I mean, my opinion would be yes. I think they should be concerned about uh, resistance. So we know there's a lot of resistance around to um, the active ingredient triclobendazole. Um, it's been reported more in sheep than in cattle, but there have certainly been reports uh, of resistance to triclobendazole in, uh, in cattle. And again, remember, it's the same parasite in both sheep and cows. So, uh, so it's really important to think about resistance. Um, so I think, I think that's why what you, what you said earlier is really important because it's a matter of targeting the right product, the right veterinary medicine, um, at the stage of the parasite which happens to be in the animal at the time. So if, you ha if you're treating in the autumn, most of the parasites will probably be immatures, juvenile parasites. So you'd want to use an active ingredient which will kill, which will kill those immature parasites. Whereas later in the season, perhaps before turnout, um, maybe you've not given a, a dose in the autumn because there was low level risk. Um, you know, the, 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 it had been a dry autumn or um, they'd been uh, kept on dry pasture or something like that. So you haven't given them an autumn treatment. Do a faecal egg count before turnout and that would be the time to use a different active and one that targets the adult fluke. Mm. So you're using different products to target different stages of the parasite, mm. which takes away some of that selection pressure on the parasite population and reduces the risk of developing mm. resistance to, to some of the other drugs around as well. Mm -hmm. And I think farmers are particularly concerned about triclobendazole as well. Mm. Um, it isn't, it's less it's of less value in cattle than in sheep. Um, we know that in cattle, it's those later stages of liver fluke that cause the biggest impact on, on thrive, on productivity. As long as we're making sure there aren't any fluke surviving that weren't susceptible to the active that we were using when we treated at housing, and then shedding eggs onto the pasture after turnout, then it's really addressing those, those mature fluke in the, the animals that are key and that will give us our greatest productivity benefit. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's all about monitoring and being yeah. targeted and understanding what, the, what we're trying to achieve really with our, our housing treatments. Mm. So just thinking about withdrawal periods um, and, and treatments, is there anything specifically, I'm just thinking about dairy really, um, that, that um, farmers should bear in mind? Yeah, I mean, if we're thinking about treating it uh, at housing in the winter, I mean, obviously for dairy cattle, it's a bit more complicated um, because of the choice of um, product for use in milking cows. And obviously there are, there are, there are milk withdrawal periods to be aware of. Um, and so I guess the option really is to treat it drying off. Most farmers would treat it drying off. Um, so you have to be very careful about which product you use uh, to check, check whether it's licensed or not in, uh, in milking cows um, and check on the milk withdrawal periods. Mm. I think that's an important point. And again, I guess from a diagnostic testing perspective, we've talked a bit about milk testing, but it's mm. quite um, straightforward and 
obviously totally non-invasive to monitor um, exposure in dairy cows, so that can help contribute to that yeah. decision making. Yeah, too. Mm -hmm. great. Good point. So we're just moving towards the end of uh, this evening's discussion, just to remind everyone that you can still ask questions uh, in the box on the right hand side. Um, so make sure that you get those in before we finish up for the evening. Um, so just moving to some takeaway messages then really. Um, could you just sum up perhaps why flute control in cattle at housing is, is so important? So to me, to me there, are, there are two points really. Um, so obviously once you house animals then they're no longer being exposed to the infection. So it's a really good point to say is my animal infected or are my animals infected? And so diagnostic testing at that point gives you a really good point to intervene. Um, and I think the, the second point is that obviously in, in house animals it's maintaining the productivity. Um, so again, treatment if needed at housing is a really good point because you actually have that intervention which benefits the animal for the rest of the housing period. Yeah, and I think I suppose in line with that it's a great time for farmers to start looking at implementing more diagnostic testing on their farm because you you have a fairly um, static picture in a way um, it's virtually the only time of the year when you have a static picture and so yeah thinking now perhaps about what um, diagnostics might be appropriate um, and putting steps in place to implement them and and determining how they'll respond to the results is um, is a really good just way of, of making some changes and becoming more targeted in parasite control. So it's obviously a really complex issue as we've sort of discussed through this evening but if farmers could change one thing to improve liver flute control what are some um, quick or easy changes that they could perhaps make? So I think one thing that I would suggest is diagnostic testing. Mm. Yeah, test before you treat. I think the thing I'd sort of re-emphasise, and it's something we've not touched on a lot this evening, is that selecting the right product um, and treating the right animals are the first steps, but treating those animals correctly has a massive bearing on, um, on the response that farmers will see to the treatment um, and on um, the sustainability of parasite control as well. We know underdosing selects for emergence of resistance, so I'd really um, suggest that farmers take an opportunity um, to check they're dosing their animals correctly, they're weighing their animals correctly and they're using the, the right administration device and that it's functioning properly and because that's when they'll, they'll see a value um, returned on that, that treatment. So that fits with the, uh, with the cows message, so cows is the uh, control of worms sustainably in cattle. Um, so the five R's, um, uh, uh, which is advocated by cows, so that is using, selecting the right product, treating the right group of animals, giving uh, the dose at the right time of year, uh, giving the correct dose for the weight of animal and administering um, the, uh, the product correctly. And I guess that again, it highlights all the resources that are out there as well. It's a yeah, good time to have a think about how um, farmers might want to change their approach to fluke control. And um, mm -hmm. there's a huge amount of resource out there, um, including the Liverpool website, including the, the cows documents um, and their own vets or animal health advisors. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that seems like a good place to wrap up for the evening. Thank you very much to both of our panellists for their time. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion. Um, and thank you the audience for taking part at home um, and for all your questions um, your input is uh, is really valid so thanks for that this webinar has also been recorded so you can take a look at it again in your own time if you wish um, and if you'd like to find out any more about the beat the parasites campaign you can head over to the hub uh, so the address for that will be available on screen at the end thank you very much for watching and good night everybody mm -hmm.